Now, Shepard Smith reporting live from the Fox News Deck. At long last, miraculously, it's Friday. Welcome to the Fox News Deck. I'm Shepard Smith. Lawyers for the man who killed two teenage intruders are trying to convince the jury that any reasonable person would do the exact same thing. Any reasonable person would shoot two teenagers nine times. That's despite the prosecution's claim that he had it in for the teens, that he carefully planned the killings in cold blood, and that he waited not hours but a full day before he even called the police. The man's name is Byron Smith. He claims he killed the teens in self-defense when they broke into his home in Minnesota back in 2012. His defense team is now making its case after the prosecution wrapped. Their last witness was a forensics expert. She testified that the gunman shot these teenage cousins a total of nine times at close range between six and 12 inches away. State law does allow the use of deadly force in Minnesota to defend yourself and your home. But the prosecutors say this crosses the line and this, they say, is murder in the first degree. They say the man parked his truck away from his house, so it looked like nobody was home. They say he waited in his basement with an audio recorder rolling, just waiting for the teens to break in. One of them had reportedly broken in several times before, and sure enough, it happened. Prosecutors say he shot the first teen the moment he stepped into the basement. They say the man then shot him again, this time in the head at close range. More than 10 minutes passed before he reloaded his gun, and that's when the audio recording captured the second teenager calling out for her cousin. He shot her. She tumbled down the basement stairs. You can hear her killer tell the wounded teen, sorry about that, and then, you're dying. And he called her a bitch. The forensics expert says the man then killed her with a close range shot to the head. What he later told investigators was a good clean finishing shot. Prosecutors say that's what makes this murder, that he killed the intruders after the threat was gone. That is against the law. The man told cops he fired that last shot because he didn't think that the teen should suffer. Trial attorney Vicki Ziegler is here with us on the Fox News deck. But first, let's get to Leah Gabriel. What happened in court today? Well, Shep, today the defense team began making their case that Byron Smith feared for his life because of a string of at least four burglaries, including burglaries where some of his weapons were stolen. Today, the defense team called their first witness a sheriff's deputy. He had looked into a burglary at Byron's residence that happened less than a month before the shooting took place. He said that they had met in mid-November and they had discussed security cameras that Smith had installed. Installed. Well, the defense team also submitted two memos as part of um, as part of the case today. Uh, they had they, they are memos, Shep, that Smith had written to local police asking for their help and listing some of the things that have been stolen, including two of his guns. A lot of evidence here for the defense to deal with. Well, that's right. And, you know, basically the defense is saying that the prosecution has provided absolutely no evidence that shows that Smith knew that there would be intruders the day of the shooting. The defense, I spoke with the defense attorney today by phone, and he told me that the media has been showing these very nice looking pictures of the two intruders, but he said that is not the image that Smith saw the day of the shooting. You didn't see how they looked when they came in. You saw them as they were walking down the stairway. They had evidently hoods around their faces and gloves on their hands. And he did not see that surveillance uh, monitor. Uh, according to the police, he wasn't in that room. Well, Smith's attorney also told me that Smith's adrenaline was pumping so hard that day that he completely lost track of the number of shots that he fired. He said that he just wanted to make sure that the intruders couldn't hurt him. And Shep, the defense plans to call a private investigator as their next, as their next witness. All right, a bit to go there. Leah, thanks. Uh, uh, Vicki Ziegler is with us, a trial attorney uh, and frequent on the program. Is the, the part that I'm interested in, if I'm a juror, mm -hmm. is this part. He shot the girl and she was down. He called her a bitch, told her she was dying, then put the gun to her head and finished her off. Between the first shot and the second shot, is that where premeditation begins or is this not a murder one case? I think it's a difficult case to prove as it relates to premeditation, but that doesn't mean that this is a murder case, whether it's a lesser degree. And the question really becomes when, in fact, you have self-defense claims. What actually justifies? What was reasonable? The first shot to each perpetrator? Probably. That was most likely self-defense because you can, as the Castle Doctrine says, you're allowed to 
kill somebody or at least try to protect yourself if you're in grave harm. The question becomes nine bullets collectively. How are you in fear when you're going up to your perpetrator and purposely shooting point blank range to kill them? There may be even a post-mortem wound. That's my biggest challenge. So the question becomes not so much as a premeditation issue as was it justified? Was it reasonable? Would anyone else in that circumstance do the same thing? I don't know anyone on this jury could say that they could actually kill two teenagers. I don't necessarily think that's going to happen. So it's a very complicated legal case. It's complicated, and yet the jury is going to have to decide whether there was premeditation. Oh, they, they have to, right. They were already instructed on that. So the question becomes, really, he was lying and waiting in the basement. He had the audio recorder set up. He got a candy bar and was waiting, waiting for them to do what? Kill them? or maim them, protect his own self in his house. That's what they have to really take a look at once they hear all of the evidence. So you, you might ask, was he protecting himself when he moved his car away? Mm -hmm. Was he protecting himself when he let the dead children stay in his house overnight before calling police right. the next day. Right. Moving the bodies. Is that relevant? All relevant. All cumulative evidence that they have to take into consideration. A premeditation trap can take one second. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a strong, elongated period of time. So in that split second, when he did, when he had one shot into the teenager, the female, then the next one, he could have said, oh my God, what's going on? Let me call the police. Let them protect me. They're down. He didn't do that. Moved the body, tampered with the uh, crime scene. Also, n and the neighbor called the police. He didn't even call the police. Police. Keep in mind, though, that I spoke with the defense attorney today, and they do have answers for this. You know, they do say he, he did say to them to come in that he heard a window break. He was scared. He said that that audio recording that was set up that was part of the surveillance system that was put in after that string of burglaries. So I think we'll hear a lot of, of this testimony. We'll hear a lot from the defense team in the coming days that may answer some of those questions. I, I, that, and we'll look forward to that, and we'll report on it. I'm guessing that if, if when the prosecutor gets to closing, mm -hmm. that prosecutor is going to talk about the time between the the, the the time between when the first shot went off mm -hmm. and hurt him telling her she's dead and then making sure she was. 100 percent ballistics. That, the time frame within is going to be crucial to determine if was it premeditation or was it a lesser murder charge. All right. Thank you both. We'll have more on this on Monday. More.